heard that wonderful chat this morning, <laughs> our Sunday talk. If you are joining us remotely through our webinar, we welcome you. And also ask for your patience because sometimes we have electronic problems, internet problems, video problems, audio problems, but you just stick with us and we'll get online. And that's what happened this morning, but I think everything is working well now. So, what am I going to talk about this morning? Permanency and transiency of life. The other day I was talking on the cell phone to a co-worker and I asked him how he was. Knowing that he had recently experienced a serious operation, he said, in response, he said, I am immortal. Well, he's in his mid-80s. And I found his response to be extraordinary. Why? Because most people instinctively think the opposite. That when they reach their mid-80s or 90s, sometimes even 50s and 60s, they think that when they reach a certain age that their life is going to come to an end. Even those who take their lives, who commit suicide, they think by committing suicide that their life ends. I did a little research to find what the length of life that a person who lives to the age 65 will be, and this is what I learned. That a man reaching age 65 today can expect to live on average until age 84.3. A woman turning age 65 today can expect to live on an average until age 86.6. And those are just averages. About one out of every four 65-year-old today will live past the age of 90 and one out of 10 will live past the age of 95. But when a light bearer, a person who travels the path of Shambhala, thinks about the longevity of their life, they think differently, as does my friend and co-worker. We think in terms of immortality, of permanency, of transiency, and especially of immortality. In the Agni Yoga teaching, we learn about the chalice of immortality. Within the chalice of immortality is stored the highest energies, the highest knowledge. Knowledge that becomes an integral part of our spirit's makeup during its infinite journey. And I want to repeat this so we can get it into our consciousness. Within the chalice, our chalice of immortality is stored the highest energies, the highest knowledge that becomes an integral part of our spirit's makeup during its infinite journey. The spirit's infinite journey, that journey is the journey of most of us here today or listening to our Sunday talk through YouTube or our webinar. As we make this journey, we take all the beauty, all the highest energies, the highest knowledge that makes up our spirit with us we, on our infinite journey. So are we yet thinking the way of my friend that we are immortal? Immortality is conscious acceptance of the realization and the experience that we are part of the divine will. 
and not a physical body. Immortality is the awareness of your changelessness in the changing process of your form. When this form, which you use on the path toward changelessness, the changing process is the part of your nature that is striving toward perfection. But when you are identified, and this is a key word, identified, when you are identified with the changes of your physical, emotional, and mental worlds, when you are identified, identified with these worlds, then you are mortal. It is only when you remain unchanged within all these changes are you immortal. The unchanged part is your spirit. The unchanged part is your spirit. My friend is fearless. He is fearless of death. Fearlessness is subjectively based on the conviction that you are immortal. You know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what happens to your body, you will continue to exist. The Master Moya, the great sage, instructed the seed of the spirit continuously carries life on. The seed of the spirit continuously carries life on. And the balloon of nerve emanations carries the spirit into the heights that the spirit has determined. Therefore, to speak of immortality is a purely scientific fact that is profoundly correct. Upon the casting away of matter, our final thought, our very final thought at that moment of transition is like an arrow. This is the moment that determines that direction of your flight. The rest is added according to your aspiration. So let us know, he says, the Master M, says, let us know how to aspire. Let us construct a rainbow conjoining the steps of the Spirit's ascent. Let us construct a rainbow conjoining the steps of the Spirit's ascent. In Agni Yoga, verse 333, it says, Religion that teaches about death will pass away as will all those who believe in death. He's giving us a vision. For some, this is a science fiction image, science fiction movie. For others, say, well, maybe, you know, that may be. But if your heart is connected with the heart of the Great Ones and you are consciously traveling this path of Shambhala, then you will believe in your immortal self. Our consciousness then, this is so important, I'm speaking slowly, which is really slow <laughs> for a Gemini. <laughs> but I want to 
<laughs> I want to make sure that we're absorbing this and understanding it and listening not from our ridiculous lower self, but it's like igniting our souls. Say, wake up a minute. Listen to what the teaching has to say about your future. Our consciousness determines our future state. Our consciousness determines our future state. Those who understand the real power of fire, which is invisible, also understands the meaning of death. Again, that's from Agni Yoga, verse 333. The Master says, our consciousness determines our future. Well, in the White Mountain Group, we have studied four books on consciousness. Several years we have studied on consciousness. So those of you that have studied in depth what the consciousness means knows what Master M is saying that our consciousness determines our future. To believe you are immortal requires you to be conscious, to have a moment of consciousness. Conscious moments are those moments in which you know the purpose of your life. Conscious moments are those moments that you know the purpose of your life and consciously try to actualize that purpose on your physical, emotional, and mental planes. Conscious moments. Conscious moments is not when you're hypnotic, when you're full of anger and hatred and revenge and all those horrible, horrible things that the mass of humanity thrives on that's, that energizes their day-to-day -day life. That's not a conscious moment. That's your animal self. And if you have animals around you, you know what an, that an animal is not conscious. They think instinctively, habitually. It's like my four Shelties. I don't need a clock in the evening because they tell me at five minutes of six, they're supposed to eat at six o'clock. <laughs> That's their habit. At 6.30 in the morning, they jump up on my bed and wake me up and they look in my eyeballs <laughs> <laughs> breakfast <laughs> right. See, and there's no anger there's no revenge there's no hatred there's no justifying anything it's just mom this is my life feed me See, that's not a conscious moment that's instinct that's habit conscious moments are those moments in which we know the purpose of our life and we are consciously going to try to actualize this purpose every single minute. We're going to try to do this, to actualize this purpose physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. But if we are caught up in our unconscious moments and allow our unconscious moments to control our lives, then we are going to find ourselves on this wheel of rebirth ad infinitum. If you are busy increasing your ego, increasing your vanity, increasing your hatred, increasing your sense of self-importance, increasing your anger and negativity, 
chasing after ways to satisfy your lower desires, your this and that, see, you're establishing your future. That's your future. And the teaching tells us explicitly, this is your unconscious destruction. So it makes no difference if you believe this or not. Because that is your future. So you can disagree and you can argue and you can say, boy, she's really off base. Or you can say, wait a minute, let me think about this. And this is how, what do you do? How do you think about this? You go to the books of conscious thinkers who have conscious moments. And not only conscious moments, but a conscious life. And those are the great ones that have given us these teachings. They're teaching us how to have conscious moments that over a span of time becomes a conscious life. Your real life duration is the moment in which you were conscious about the purpose of your life. And then you tried to actualize it in your conscious thoughts, your words, your actions, your real life duration. I'm repeating this, your real life duration. It could be this long, or this long, or this long, or this long. Your real life duration is the moment in which you were conscious about your purpose of life and then trying to actualize it through your conscious thoughts, words, and actions. The teaching reveals that sometimes in 700 lives, we have only one or two months of a conscious life. One or two months out of 700 lifetimes. Holy cow! <laughs> That's just unconscionable. <laughs> This means that this is what is stored in our chalice. Those one or two months out of 700 lives is what is stored in our chalice. In 70 lives, now this is a little mathematics here, in 70 lives, so we've gone through the 700, now we're starting the 70. In 70 lives, you may have three months of a conscious life that then's added to your one or two months that took place over 700 years. So now we have five months, let's say, of a conscious life. In seven lives, you may have one life that is really conscious. So after 700 plus 70 plus seven lives, we may have one complete life that is conscious. If you add the duration of your conscious moments, you will see how many lives you are unconscious in those 777 incarnations. It's profound. The one conscious incarnation, and this is the part that's so exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting. The one conscious incarnation was the incarnation in which you made a jump toward the higher realms. And in so doing brought all your being into a higher level of transformation. The great sage says, quote, ignorant of the beginning 
and seeing only the end. The disassociated spirit aimlessly passes through life. What is the disassociated spirit? Let me go back. Let us construct, M.M. says, let us construct a rainbow conjoining the steps see, of the Spirit's ascent. Going back here, moving forward here. Ignorant of the beginning and seeing only the end, the disassociated Spirit, right? disassociated spirit aimlessly, aimlessly passes through life. But everyone may earn immortality by admitting infinity into their consciousness. Fearlessness toward death and striving toward the infinite will provide your spirit with the direction to the spheres of cosmic endlessness. Affirm yourselves in the acceptance of immortality and infuse into your actions a spark of the creativeness of the cosmic fire and that inexorable fate which will be transformed into the one call of cosmic life. Our great just law has chosen you as participants in the universal manifestations. See, from the one call of the cosmic life, put us into the wheel of life. Recognize immortality and cosmic justice. A beautiful step is prepared for everyone. Find the path of thinking about immortality. Through all your 700 lives, 700 incarnations, the one conscious incarnation was that one moment in which you made that jump. That one life that you made that jump. It is so interesting to note that though a person lives in a state of transiency, in every one of his thoughts and emotions and possessions, he desires and strives for permanency, for immortality. For example, most of us wish and try to make our homes, our money, our land, and our bodies permanent. We try to make our happiness or our hatred or our joy permanent. There is something in us that wants permanency. Look at what's happening with Hurricane Irma in Florida. What is the single most important element that's going on, if not preservation of life? Right? See, it's inherent. It's instinctive. It is this, this strong desire to strive toward permanency. See, but we're so blind, we don't see it. We're saying, I have to save my life because I'm going to die if I don't. Well, if we could just see our whole lifespan as Hurricane Irma, a Category 5 or a Category 6, as a way to establish our immortality, imagine how we would live our life. <coughs> we no longer throw it away on stupidities. According to the ageless wisdom, only a permanent existence can imagine or desire permanency because permanency is a memory or experience collected in the higher worlds. So read the books of the teaching. I'm thinking 
the book At the Threshold of the New World by Helena Rourke. It's a great book to start. And then you move from there into her letters. And then from there into the series of Agni Yoga books, starting with, I would start with the book The Heart. And then go to Super Mundane. And then go to Infinity, one, two, and three. And then go to Fiery Worlds. It'll keep you busy the rest of your life. <laughs> However, transiency and permanency fight with each other for millions of ages. Every minute, every life, on many planes. The hope of permanency comes the moment when you have a glimpse. You have a glimpse of permanency. A glimpse of immortality. All life is organized in such a way that we search for permanency. We search for permanency because there exists within us the one that is permanent, spirit. The permanency is trapped within our nature. It's trapped, this permanency, our immortality, is trapped within our nature by our glamours and our illusions and our blind urges and our drives. It's like a person can live their whole life with anger and hatred and revenge. Imagine that. The spirit of striving must be the foundation of our life the spirit of striving. Helena Rohr wrote, the spirit which seeks to kindle its energy by striving is a fuser of matter. She says, after fusing matter, we will then refine it. And then the finest perceptions will be reached that these are the only possibilities for true life and immortality. I think back, you know, over all the dogs that I've had and all the dog own owners I know, and I'm now on a Facebook page of Sheltie owners. There is 16,000 people on this Facebook. <laughs> If you could imagine, it's quite an experience. It's pretty overwhelming. But this is the deal. We get this little puppy. And then some of us think that we have to create the best environment for this puppy. We want to train this puppy to bring out the very best and the greatest poten potential this puppy has. So we teach our puppy how to strive. We put him into puppy obedience classes. So they'll pee outside, not inside. That's the first step, right? And then if we see that our dog has some potential, we put them into all different kinds of classes, confirmation classes, rally classes, agility classes, and all of these classes. You know what's happening? We are promoting striving in the spark of this little puppy. No, we're doing the same thing to ourselves as a human being, but in a, a much more um, progressive manner because we're not animals, we're human beings headed toward becoming superhuman beings. So if we can teach our puppies hey, how to be better, then let us do the same thing with ourselves. These are the only possibilities for true life and immortality. Evolution in reality is a quest for immortality, for permanence.
Every new level of permanency, every new level of, I lost my place, sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited. I love this talk. I just think it's a, I love the subject. I love the idea of striving, of recognizing what it means to be conscious and to have a whole conscious life and to be immortal. I think it's so beautiful. So every new level of permanency is an initiation or expansion of consciousness which is the victory of a level of immortality. The more permanent we are, the more creative we are. And the more creative we are, our creativity evokes more permanency in others. See that? We must contact reality and permanency, not transiency. To contact reality creates a crisis in our life, and it, by Jove, it does. To contact reality creates a crisis in our life. It is a very dangerous adventure to contact reality because it will shatter you into pieces. All that you think you have, all that you think you do, all that you think you are. It will shatter you into pieces. This is why some of us have accepted an earthly teacher instead of learning by trial and error. If we allow that teacher to help us contact that reality, we will take giant steps toward expansion of consciousness and initiation. And this I believe and have experienced. The teacher may one day test you, show you that a glamour is controlling your emotions. In other words, that teacher will reveal a reality, the a truth to you. And what's going to happen? It creates a crisis. You may cry, you may get angry, or you may want to run away. Or instead, you will recognize the reality and take your next step toward the infinite, toward reality. You will either expand your consciousness or you will fight back and digress. Some people are disappointed by life. Disappointment comes when the person realizes that they did not find reality in those things that they were expecting to find reality in. Unreality is so abundant within our actions, our words, and thoughts, that often if any reality visits our life, we don't recognize it. The teacher tells you to do this, to stop doing that, and you run away. You did not see the light of reality. You did not see your purpose of life, the infinite path, the path of immortality, evolution. Every new level of permanency is an initiation or an expansion of consciousness, the victory of a level of immortality. There is a beautiful mantra that you can say every day at noon to remind yourself about the immortality of your spirit. It is called the mantra of the self, the capital S self. You're going to recognize this. <laughs> More radiant than the sun, purer than the snow, subtler than the ether is the self. The spirit, the spirit within my heart. I am that self, that self am I. Trying every day to control the reality in you helps you to avoid getting lost in the transient tides of life. If you center your consciousness in the permanent self, 
things that are transient in your life no longer bother you. Remind yourself that you are reality. You have to fight to sort out all those things that are wasting your time and energy and preventing you from dedicating yourself to the permanent objects of life. If you stick to this gear, your consciousness, this gear of understanding, your consciousness will advance toward the realness of reality. If you have not taken at least the initiation of transfiguration, you are impermanent because it is not until then in each successive incarnation you do not have the awareness of the same entity, that same spirit that is within you. Do you want me to repeat that? If you have not at least taken the initiation of transfiguration, you are impermanent. Because until then, until then, each successive incarnation, all those 777 incarnations, you do not have an awareness that you are the same entity, the same spirit within you. You don't have the awareness of it. We are always somebody else in our many incarnations. You can read about the many lives of the Buddha. Torquem Seridarian shared a bit about some of his lives. Perhaps you too know about a few incarnations that you have had. In each incarnation you had a different name. If you have taken the transfiguration initiation, in every life thereafter, you will remember who you were in the past. Permanency, immortality is established within you. When you become a master, you are permanent and transiency disappears from your nature. A master's consciousness, awareness, and memory is permanent. They are immortal. A permanent memory is built of the recollection of those permanent moments from your lives. Buddha says, I remember when once, ages ago, I was a turtle. I was a bear. I was a beggar. Consciousness, memory, and awareness are the keys to immortality, continuity, and permanency. So be somebody. Do you see? People destroy their consciousness, their memory, and awareness. How do they destroy these things? How do you destroy your consciousness? How do you, how do you destroy your memory? How do you destroy your awareness because you fill yourselves with moments and events and attachments of elements that are transient? Most people live, speak, and do things in their life to increase the impermanence of their life. One day a close friend <clears throat> was diagnosed with cancer. The doctor gave her six weeks to live. She asked me to go to the library and get some Daniel Steele books for her to read. Entertaining, but superficial. I did as she asked. Then a few later, I began to talk to her about immortality, then karma, then reincarnation. Then I asked her if she wanted to look at her horoscope, her astrological chart, to learn more about herself. 
Then we talked about forgiveness. Then we talked about all those things in her life that were real. She extended her life beyond those six weeks and lived for a whole year. She died knowing that she could strive toward immortality. She was happy. For the few days before her death, she was in a coma. And she was also conscious, so aware that we were in telepathic communication. The greatest law in the universe is immortality, permanency. Those who live according to that law do not need courts. They do not need lawyers to protect themselves. The law of immortality is the law of self-realization. A life lived with transient and impermanent values leads you to karma. And karma tries to help you discover the path of reality. It makes you wander and become so saturated Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R. It makes you wander and become so saturated in the impermanent worlds with pain and suffering so that eventually you find the path of permanency, the, of immortality. All permanent moments in your thousands of reincarnations build reality within you. It is the elements of permanency in your whole journey throughout lives that provide elements to build your soul. And that's it. <laughs>